Welcome to the Archive of Nations, home of the custodians of the sacred records from time immemorial. Please subscribe and press the notification button as we have many lessons to educate and empower with a correct narrative of the past to create a lawful blueprint for the future. In this episode called The Egyptian and Phoenician Realities of Troy Part 2, we continue the narrative of the Trojan War. In the previous webisode, we established who the founders of Troy were and the role of the Kushite Ethiopians. The Trojan War was fought in 1200 BC allegedly because the husband of Helen, Menelaos, was upset at Helen being kidnapped to Troy in modern-day Turkey. Homer wrote about this story from oral tales in 800 BC. The carbon organic Egyptians planted their flags in Troy in victory under Pharaoh Sinwashrit as discussed in previous webisodes. Homer mentions that carbon organic Afar Inca tribes that helped Agamemnon fight, who were arming themselves amid a cloud of footmen. Thick black clumps of sturdy Yonkers moved towards the battle, bristling with spears and shields, the Iliad Book 4.280. This sacred record deemed legend lies at the very core of what is commonly called Western civilization and culture. Troy was first settled around 3600 BC and grew into a small fortified city around 3000 BC and is located on the Aegean Sea on the northwestern corner of Asia Minor in present-day Turkey. It was strategically situated at the entrance of the Hellespont now known as the Dardanelles, which is the first of the two straits that connects the Mediterranean to the Black Sea via the Sea of Marmara. The legendary founder of the city was Ilus, the son of Tros, from whom the name is derived. In the founding myths of the city of Troy, the god Heracles is recorded as having captured the city. In early eras, Hercules was known as an Ethiopic god of Egyptian origin, as we will explore in the next forthcoming webisodes. Heracles, also known as Melkort, was a specially favored god of the Phoenician Canaanites. As seafaring traders, the carbon organic Phoenicians had a strong connection with the profitable Black Sea region to the north of Troy. The city of Troy was therefore undoubtedly the key part of the Phoenician maritime commercial network. It should therefore be no surprise to learn that similar to other places where Phoenician traders established communities, a temple of Heracles was also to be found in Troy. Not only are the Phoenicians directly linked to the story of Helen of Troy, but the Egyptians as well were also major players in the entire sequence of events that led up to the Trojan War. The significance is that in the end, the story of Helen of Troy and the Trojan War are not exclusively hybrid albino-Asian events at all. They are very much a part of any proper examination of Afar Inca or Kushite Ethiopic history and heritage. The story of Helen and the Trojan War occurred during the reign of Priam, the grandson of Ilus, the founder of the ancient city of Troy. Modern archaeological excavations have shown that Troy was destroyed by fire sometime in the early 12th century BCE, which matches the traditional date of the war. The origins of the Trojan War can also be traced back to a spate of recorded female kidnappings that seem to have been a regular feature of that time. It is also notable that the carbon organic Phoenician Canaanites were deeply involved in the whole matter from the outset. According to Gregory Nagy in his piece for the Center of Hellenistic Studies called Herodotus and Logioi of the Persians, he relates in part that at the beginning of his histories, Herodotus says that the Persians claimed that the cause of the great conflict between the so-called Greeks and the Persians, which is the main subject of the histories, must be attributed to the Phoenicians, not to the Persians, nor to the Greeks. Herodotus goes on to say, it was the Phoenicians who had once abducted a heroine named Io from the Greek city of Argos and brought her to Egypt. Herodotus goes on to say further that the Greeks reacted to this act of wrongdoing by abducting a heroine named Europa from the Phoenicians, specifically from the Phoenician city of Tyre. To the Greeks, Tyre was the main city of Phoenicia, a country from which they believed to have borrowed many aspects of their culture. In legendary times, the king of this land had been Agenor, the father of Cadmus and Europa, one of the lovers of Zeus. In his Metamorphoses, the Roman poet Ovid, 43 BCE, 17 CE, tells how Zeus, who had taken on the shape of a bull, had abducted the Phoenician princess, who was to be the mother of Minos and Sarpedon. Cadmus, who searched for his sister, was to settle in Greece and would become the founder of the city of Thebes. The myth of Europa is tightly linked to the origin of social development in Europe. Her son Minos is the legendary king of the Minoan civilization, the earliest known civilization in Europe covered in webisodes 1 to 3 in the Fallacy of Greece and Rome series. As also discussed in previous webisodes, the cult of the sacred bull was idolized all around the Mediterranean Sea, taking its root from the carbon organic civilization of ancient Egypt. 
Apis was the most popular of three great bull cults of ancient Egypt, which all are related to the worship of Hathor. The worship of Apis was continued by the Greeks and after them by the Romans, and lasted until almost 400 CE. This animal was chosen because it symbolized the courageous heart, great strength, and fighting spirit of the king. Apis came to being considered a manifestation of the king, as bulls were symbols of strength and fertility, qualities that are closely linked with kingship. Strong bull of his mother Hathor was a common title for Egyptian gods and male kings. Occasionally, Apis was pictured with the sun disc symbol of his mother, Hathor, between his horns, being one of few deities ever associated with her symbol. Hathor was connected with trade and foreign lands, possibly because her role as a sky goddess linked her with stars and hence navigation, and because she was believed to protect ships on the Nile and in the seas beyond Egypt as she protected the bark of Ra in the sky. The mythological wandering of the goddess in Nubia or Libya gave her a connection with those lands as well. It is interesting to note that Libya was a legendary Egyptian princess in the south and remarkably, Libya was also a granddaughter of Io and grandmother of Europa. She personified the land of ancient Libya in North Africa, from which the name of modern-day Libya originated. Princess Libya is the daughter of Epiphus, king of Egypt, in both Greek and Roman mythology. Epiphus, also called Apis, was also known as the father of Thebes, whom was mother of Egyptus and Heracles. Through his daughters Libya, Epiphus was regarded the ancestor of the dark Libyans and high-souled Ethiopians and the underground folk and feeble pygmies. It seems with thorough investigation of all Greek mythologies, carbon organic Afarinka roots are undeniable. The Hellespont was the strait traversed by Europa's sister of Cadmus when she came on a bull being the symbol of kingship, bringing with her the knowledge accumulated by the eastern sons of Asia from the land of the rising sun, whose teachings were imparted to the people of old Europe, known as the Western land. We need also to be clear that as reported by Herodotus, these Asiatic Greeks are not Hellenes or the hybrid albino Asians as we see them today. They are carbon organic Asiatics, just like the Persians and the Phoenicians. In terms of this same formulation, it is only the Greeks of the Hellenic mainland, that is, of Hellas, who are Hellenes whom are immigrants to the peninsula. The Greeks of Asia Minor and of the outlying islands were not Hellenes, but Aeolians, Ionians, and Dorians, all of Asiatic Phoenician, Persian, and Egyptian heritage. These Asiatic Greeks are listed here in roughly geographical order, proceeding from north to south. I find it also relevant to highlight the fact that Herodotus of Halicarnassus was an Asiatic Greek in his own right. So, we have the narrative that in the histories, Herodotus tells us that the Persians claimed that it was the Phoenicians to first begin the quarrel. The Phoenicians arrived in Argos where a large group of women came to the coast, including Io, the daughter of Anachos. The Phoenicians, passing word to one another, decided to make a rush to capture the women. Many escaped, but Io and others were taken and kidnapped to Egypt, Herodotus 1.1. Herodotus goes on to say further that the Greeks reacted to this act of wrongdoing by abducting a heroine named Europa from the Phoenicians. In the histories, Herodotus 1.2, the Greeks then abduct a heroine named Medea from Caucasus in the Far East, which is another carbon organic civilization as stated by the Greek poet named Pindar, 522-443 BC. He described the Chalkians as being dark-skinned with woolly hair and according to Pliny the Elder, the Chalkians were governed by their own kings in the earliest ages, that Sesostris king of Egypt was overcome in Scythia and put to flight by the king of Caucasus, which if true, that the Chalkians not only had kings in those times, but were a very powerful people. Also in 350 to 400 AD, church fathers St. Jerome and Sophronius referred to Caucasus as the second Ethiopia because of its black population which is found in Patrick T. English's Cushites, Caucians, and Khazars, Journal of Near Eastern Studies, Volume 18, January to October 1959, page 53. When the carbon organic Phoenicians reacted by demanding not only the return of the heroine Medea but also compensation for her abduction, the carbon organic Asiatic Greeks refused, offering the excuse that they had never been compensated for the original abduction of Princess Io by the Phoenicians, nor had Io been returned. At this point, as the report of Herodotus about the Persian version continues, the conflict between Asiatic Greeks and Asiatic Phoenicians escalates. Now some 40 years after the abduction of Medea, Paris of Troy, who was the son of Priam, was apparently inspired by these stories to obtain a wife for himself out of Greece. It seems he was confident that he would not have to pay for his actions any more than the Greeks had been required to. 
Paris sailed to Sparta in Greece, where by all reports he was hospitably received by Helen and her husband, Menelaus, king of Sparta. However, although she was supposedly living happily with her spouse, Paris was not only able to seduce Helen, but also to persuade her to run off with him back north to Troy. Ironically, it was this simple woman-stealing dispute that is supposed to have started the great enmity between the Persians and the Greeks. This hatred eventually led to the massive Persian invasion of Greece in 480 BC and the subsequent Greco-Persian Wars that marked a major turning point in European and world history. These ancient wars between the Carbon Organic Greeks and Carbon Organic Asiatic Persians greatly helped to create and widen the Western Mediterranean and Eastern Mediterranean divide. This initial discord over time took on not just political but also religious overtones. The enmity stems from the fact that at the time of Helen's kidnapping the leaders of Asia took great offense to the Greeks coming into what they viewed as Asiatic lands with such a huge force, especially over what was generally considered to be only a minor matter. The Spartan Greeks went ahead and dispatched their huge invading army under the pretext of going to get Helen back and in the end they completely destroyed Troy and the Empire of Priam, sending into exile those Trojans who escaped. Note, we will follow the Carbon Organic Exiles in later webisodes as we explore the fallacy of Rome and the histories of the Isles of the Britons in future webisodes. Now the very great irony is that although she is known throughout history as Helen of Troy, this woman never ever once set foot in that city. She should properly be called only Helen of Sparta. If she is to be connected to any other place at all, there is a great deal more justification for calling her Helen of Memphis, i.e. Helen of Egypt. After her abduction, Helen was never taken directly to Troy, but ended up in Egypt. The Egyptian priests say Paris and Helen were blown off course on their way to Troy and shipwrecked. His point of landing was the mouth of the Nile, in the very ancient Phoenician Kenani port district of Budo, where there was a temple dedicated to Heracles. One of the features of the Temple of Heracles in Egypt was its reputation as a shrine where runaway slaves could take refuge. Once in the temple, they could not be touched by their former masters, provided in return the runaways went into lifelong service of the god Heracles. The servants of Paris took refuge at the shrine and denounced him as a rapist to the local Egyptian official, Thonis. The servants explained to the temple priests that in addition to seducing the wife of his friend and host and running off with her, Paris had also left with a quantity of treasures from the man's house. It should be noted that in ancient times the Egyptians were widely known for being a very just and righteous people who did not at all condone such kinds of uncivilized behavior, especially the abuse of hospitality. As a consequence, the warden in the district of Budo sent a message about the matter to the pharaoh Perdus in Memphis, who then ordered that Paris be arrested. Thonis had Paris arrested and brought before King Perdus at Memphis, 113-14. Because Paris was a stranger and the ancient Egyptians had a policy of not punishing anyone who had reached their shores due to bad weather, they apparently agreed to just let him go. They gave Paris three days to get out of the country, but kept Helen and the treasure until the Greeks could come to fetch them. All this leads Herodotus to ask the Egyptian priests whether in their opinion the Trojan War really happened. Menelaus himself told their predecessors that it did, but that the Greeks only learned the truth that Helen was in Egypt after the fall of Troy, 118. However, as it turned out, the Greeks unknowingly went ahead and sent their strong force to Troy to demand the restoration of the girl and the treasure. When the force arrived, naturally the Trojans told the Greeks what they were looking for was not there, but back in Egypt, and explained that they could not return something they did not have. But it seems the Greeks thought the Trojans were just giving them the runaround, and it is this that caused them to lay siege to Troy for some time until it finally fell. After the city was taken, there was still no Helen to be found. It was only then that the Spartan Greeks finally believed the Trojan story, which was that if Menelaus wanted his property back, he needed to go visit the pharaoh Perdus in Egypt. So leaving Troy in ruins, Menelaus sailed off to Egypt, met the Egyptian king, and related his account. Apparently, the Egyptians then entertained him very hospitably, and both Helen and his property were duly returned to him. However, like his former friend Paris, King Menelaus of Sparta did not seem to have been a man of any particularly high virtue either. He subsequently proved to be less than a friend of Egypt because despite all the Egyptians had done for him, he reportedly repaid them in a most abominable manner. When it was time for him to leave Egypt, Menelaus the Greek was delayed for several days by unfavorable winds and in an effort to change his fortune he reportedly took two Egyptian children and offered them up as human sacrifice. 
Herodotus believes this version and supports it with an argument from probability. If the Trojans had had Helen, they would surely have given her back rather than allow their entire city to be destroyed. 120. That then is the Egypto-Phoenician version of the story of Helen of Troy as told to Herodotus by the priests of Egypt. It clearly shows that in actual history Helen never ever once set foot in Troy. What's more, there was never any decisive single combat duel between Paris and Menelaus that was bravely watched by noble Helen and the two opposing armies. There was no compassion felt by all present prompted by her matchless beauty and great sorrow and Menelaus did not take her back home to Sparta from Troy but instead retrieved her from Egypt and ritually sacrificed two innocent children before he left. There are very strong practical reasons for considering the authenticity of the Egypto-Phoenician version of that classic story compared to the Homeric tale. For one thing, the Egyptian authorities seem to have been directly involved in the whole matter from the beginning. Additionally, being the major economic and geopolitical power in the region at that time, like their maritime Phoenician allies, the Egyptians would have been quite concerned about any prolonged conflict that disrupted maritime trade in the lucrative Black Sea area. Furthermore, unlike the other mainly oral cultures in the rest of the region, ancient Egypt had a strong tradition of keeping quantities of written records of past events going back thousands of years, which the temple priests carefully preserved in their libraries. Nevertheless, despite the integral role played by people of African origin in the story of Helen of Troy, the incident has come down to us mainly as a lily-white classic Euro-centered legend. Three ancient Greek authors denied that Helen ever went to Troy. Instead, they suggested Helen stayed in Egypt during the duration of the Trojan War. Those three authors are Euripides, Stesichorus, and Herodotus. In the version put forth by Euripides in his play Helen, Hera fashioned the likeness of Helen, Eidolon, out of clouds at Zeus' request. Hermes took her to Egypt, and Helen never went to Troy, spending the entire war in Egypt. Eidolon is also present in Stesichorus' account, but not in Herodotus' rationalizing version of the myth. Herodotus adds weight to the Egyptian version of events by putting forward his own evidence. He traveled to Egypt and interviewed the priests at Memphis. The ancient Greek writer Homer seems to have known the correct Helen story, but apparently preferred to exercise poetic license. Nonetheless, the Iliad does hint at both the stay of Helen in Egypt as well as other Egyptian elements, and the Odyssey also mentions the stay of Menelaus in Egypt and also in the Odyssey, Homer writes about Helen the daughter of Zeus being in Egypt. Although it is essentially a Homeric tale, the version of the story of Helen's trip to Troy that became implanted in Western popular imagination is probably not really from Homer. It is contained in the work called The Cypria, most likely written by one Stasinus of Cyprus. However, it is the constant retelling of the more popular, but dubious, versions of ancient tales without referring to the true natures of the players involved that has helped to perpetuate the fantasy of the so-called noble European past. Consequently, the story of Helen of Troy, the face that is said to have launched a thousand ships, is now universally considered to be an exclusively European tale. We are never told that Ethiopic people of Africa exercising their traditional values of truth and righteousness were apparently major players in the whole drama. Join us on the next episode as we continue to unravel the mysteries of our past to create a better blueprint for the future for all fallen humanity. This series, The Claim of Thrones, will take you on a journey through the universe, across the galactic heavens to the eventual seating of the planet Earth. This series will also cover the hidden realities of how humanity came about, the various cataclysms and restarts, and follow the various bloodlines of indigenous rites of inheritance. This narrative sets the sacred record straight in regards to who's who on the planet Earth and begins the journey of the lawful reversion and restitution for the heirs of Mother Earth. If you like this content, please subscribe and hit the notification button as well as support across our many social media platforms.